Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about recovering from an affair. This is the ultimate guide to healing. My guest Michelle was fed up with the way her husband would ignore things he didn't want to deal with, like the conflict that his daughter was causing, even though she was begging him to address the issues. But she was even more crushed when she learned he had another woman. It was an all-time low for her. But what she did next caused her husband to open up to her and woo her again, and now Her marriage is better than ever. She's going to describe exactly what she did so you can do it too. And then I'll be giving out the worst relationship advice of the week award, which you may be doing without even realizing it. And it's sucking the life out of your relationship. All of that is coming up. But first, let's talk about recovering from an affair, the ultimate guide to healing. When you discover your partner's infidelity, a horrible sinking feeling washes over you followed by a quick wave of denial, if you're like most humans. It can't be true, you try to reassure yourself, even as another wave of realization pummels you with the truth. This is actually happening to you, even though you never thought it would. Being the victim of a cheating spouse is a heartbreaking sucker punch to the gut. It's also terrifying because if the person you trusted to be faithful to you isn't, that calls everything into question. What's the point of anything if the love and commitment you thought you had are a sham? Your happiness and hope are sucked out of you as though you've crossed paths with a dementor from a Harry Potter book. Is there really hope that you'll ever stop feeling like a complete fool and feel desired, taken care of, and special again? Well, of course there is. I've seen it too many times to doubt it, but I get that it does not feel that way today. As hard as it is when you discover your partner's infidelity, there's plenty you can do to speed the healing process and come out with an even better marriage than before. Really, these six how-tos will help you come through this challenge with your dignity, your self-respect, and a marriage that's stronger than ever. Number one, How to get relief from the pain of infidelity while keeping your dignity. Well, as a mere mortal woman yourself, you probably want him to hurt. Of course you do. That's exactly what happens to humans when we're so mournfully wounded ourselves. Your hurt and anger are valid and they deserve their day in the sun. Start with moping, maybe. Maybe commit to Moping all darn day and don't let anyone out mope you. Next, give your anger its due. Throw things and scream, but not at him. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. It's actually you I'm thinking about here. It's your dignity I'm wanting to protect. It is likely already taken some hits in this ordeal, and that's understandable. But the sooner you can stop saying things to him that you might regret later, justified though they may be, the sooner you'll stop feeling the throbbing pain in your heart. I'm not saying you have to forgive or forget, not by a long shot. It's just that when anger tinged with hurt and fear is in the driver's seat, you're likely to end up somewhere that you never wanted to go. You could get there with an emotional hangover too. And for what? Catharsis. That's what. You're craving relief, which that dangerous conversation with him holds the promise to give you. Of course, you deserve to be heard and seen. That's important. And you can get that elsewhere. You can talk to your mom or your sister or your bartender or your AA sponsor or your priest or rabbi or friend or a relationship coach. The distinction between tending to your own emotional needs at this time and punishing him with harsh words is choosing your audience wisely. In my experience, my emotional well-being suffers when I indulge my desire for revenge by saying nasty things to someone I'm furious with. It's a hidden cost that took me years to recognize, but finally, I'm able to see how my toxic words just boomerang back to me immediately and painfully, spoiling any feeling of satisfaction from letting him have it. 
What's been more satisfying and self-loving is getting what I really need, which is someone to witness my hurt, my anger, my shock, my fear. If I bear my soul to someone who wasn't involved, I avoid temptation and I still get relief without all the unpleasant side effects of inflicting that punishment. Well, with the exception of one important caveat that I'll explain shortly. These days, I'd rather take care of me and my emotional needs with a neutral party than indulge my human but expensive desire for revenge, which I now think of as the emotional equivalent of touching a hot stove. I'm just going to get burned. Number two, how to speed up the healing from infidelity. Even if only 51% of you is leaning toward trying to save your marriage, you deserve a medal, truly. It takes so much courage to do what you're doing. Many women will never find that courage. You're likely questioning whether it's worth it, whether your marriage can ever be shiny and happy again. You might be vacillating. One minute you fantasize that he'll come back begging for your forgiveness and telling you it was all his fault and that he'll never, ever, ever do it again and that you were always the only one for him so you can be reunited for good. The next minute you envision dramatically telling him he's lost you forever and walking away for the last time. Imagine the look on his face. It's a good thing it's a woman's prerogative to change her mind, right? But here's something powerful you can do right now to affect the outcome of the crisis you're in. Decide what your intention is. What is your intention? And since you're listening to the Empowered Wife podcast, it seems like your intention is to heal from any betrayal and fix your marriage. I'm checking because another piece of the healing is to land on a decision, even if you completely change your mind again by 2.31 p.m. Just for a millisecond, what is your intention with your relationship? Do you want to fix your marriage? It may feel safer to stay in murky indecision, but it's actually prolonging your suffering. Indecision is painful. Mixed energy will keep you miserable. So one thing you can do today is decide. Decide. Then you can decide again later or tomorrow. Just decide for right this minute. Why? Because when you decide, you stop being the victim. You don't have to stay in this marriage. You don't have to end this marriage. It's your decision. Doesn't that sound good right about now? And maybe you don't feel like it's your decision because he's forcing your hand, saying he's going to file for divorce or refusing to end the affair. But that's on his side of the street. What's on yours? How will you use your formidable influence? Only you can know what your decision is. And once you acknowledge that decision, you become much more powerful. Number three, how to get rid of the other woman. Another thing you can do for faster healing for yourself and your marriage is to starve the other woman of oxygen. This is just a metaphor. I'm not saying you should literally suffocate her, although I could see why you might want to. It's just a metaphor. I know it's tempting to confront the other woman, to let her know what a homewrecker she is and what an idiot she is to date a married man, and that you're not blind to what's going on. The illusion is that by checking on her uh, social media or, or his phone, you'll know more about your safety and your future prospects. That illusion is strong. But all of that works the opposite of how you want it to, because what you focus on increases. So you'd be giving her oxygen in the form of your attention, your thoughts, your energy, which results in her growing more prominent in your life and your husband's life. But how can you ignore her when she seems to be the source of all the suffering you're enduring now? Well, it takes some commitment and some determination for sure. But what if acting as if she didn't exist? were the key to ending your own suffering. Well, that's what we see on our campus, where women commune to get the encouragement to choose their focus carefully so that they're having the experience they want to have, not the one they don't want to have. One of my coaches describes how her husband's mistress 
was her focus for years before she learned this truth and got the support that she needed to follow through with it. She was amazed that the woman completely disappeared from their lives shortly after that. If you want the other woman completely out of your lives, one powerful thing you can do is stop bringing her up yourself, even to yourself. She's just a distraction from your highest priority of making yourself happy, even if you don't feel like you've got much to be happy about right now. Number four, how to avoid the worst myths about surviving infidelity. Oh, you'll hear advice that you have to stop talking to him. You might read that uh, step one of recovering from an affair is that he has to end things with his affair partner. And until that happens, you're stuck waiting around. And it could be a while. You'll see expert advice that you should separate or kick him out or even that you have to divorce or else you're not respecting yourself. But I've watched thousands of students buck all that bad advice and make real lasting change in their relationships that exceeded their own expectations. One woman waited six months following a therapist's advice that there could be no progress until her husband ended his affair, though she felt more powerless and hopeless with each passing month. When she decided that she could do what she could on her side of the street using the six intimacy skills and the connection framework, she saw incredible progress. Her husband turned toward her and away from his affair partner in just two months. And she regretted that she had wasted those six months previous. Wanting to keep your family intact does not make you a fool. Research shows that being married improves your health, improves your general well-being, your standard of living, your overall income, your resistance to disease, and a reduction in alcohol and substance abuse. Married people have more and better sex than singles and are at a lower risk of suicide. Even if it's just because you don't want to lose status or you don't want to lose money or because of the kids, staying married after an affair is a big accomplishment. I've seen enough courageous, committed women fix their marriages after a betrayal to know it takes more strength and wisdom to stay than it does to end your marriage. Number five, how to get a mentor to help you. Did you know there are women who have lived through an affair and made it to the other side with a happy, healthy marriage who are willing to show you exactly what they did to heal from infidelity? Their whole job is to guide you, support you, stand for your greatness as you embark on the journey to your own happy, healthy marriage. These women are called certified relationship coaches, and they are a rare and powerful breed. No one can identify with your situation quite like she can, and that empathy is something you definitely deserve right now. Remember I said there's a caveat about getting things off your chest with a third party like your friends or your mom or your sister? Telling the story again and again will help with your healing, but if you tell a friend or relative the terrible things he did to you, It may color their view of the man for a long time to come. People who love you want to protect you. And down the road, they might think reminding you of how awful he once was is a good way to do that. They might even tell you to leave him, even if that's not what you think is best for your family or for yourself. That's why it's so valuable to have an audience who can empathize and also keep her eye on the ball of healing your marriage if that's an option you want to keep open. Your relationship coach will do all of that. You don't want to be alone with this, and you might not want to be relying on well-meaning friends who may love you to bits, but not have the wisdom and the experience to advise you. Having a coach is the fastest way to heal an infidelity, which comes with so much urgency and pressure on you. You shouldn't have to be alone with that. That's not right. A relationship coach stands for your greatness and for your husband's greatness, even if he may not deserve it right now. She can help you find your inner wisdom and illustrate the trusty skills that she's learned along the way and point out blind spots that would otherwise impede your progress. Number six, how to have hope for your future. An overview of infidelity research from the Zur Institute found that most couples survive an affair rather than getting divorced, and that most affairs 
don't last beyond the falling in love phase and they are short term. So if your intention is to stay married, the odds are in your favor, even if that's not what he's saying right now. You're the one he married in front of God and everybody. You're the one he's made a life with and likely has uh, joint property or kids or, or cats with. She's just someone on the side. He can't marry her because he's already married to you. And that will start to bother her pretty soon, by the way, especially if he's not leaving you, especially if he's not divorcing you. She may get shrill about that, for one thing. And that tends to burst the infatuation bubble pretty quickly. The grass doesn't seem so much greener anymore. And we have a saying about it around here. A wife with the intimacy skills trumps a mistress every day of the week and twice on Sundays. I've come to think of affairs as the breakdown before the breakthrough. It's an intense pain that's bringing your attention to this part of your life. You know, the part that's on fire. And when you bring your focus to your relationship and more importantly to your own self-discovery as a result of this crisis, magical things can result. One of my coaches was describing such a miracle recently when she shared about a student who did get divorced and then wrote months later to let her coach know that they had remarried and they were happier than ever. And this client talked about how she had learned so much about herself and was a happier person overall. And that's the kind of thing we witness around here a lot. And it never gets old. It always gives me chills. I mean, it's cause for celebration. If that can happen for her and for thousands of other students on our campus, then why not you too? If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest, Michelle, was fed up with the way her husband would ignore things he didn't want to deal with, like the conflict that his daughter was causing, even though she was begging him to address the issues. But she was even more crushed when she learned he had another woman. It was an all-time low for her. But what she did next caused her husband to open up to her and woo her again. And now her marriage is better than ever. She's going to describe exactly what she did so that you can do that too. Michelle, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So I'd love to hear about the battle days. Take us back. What were things like in your marriage? Well, it was not our first marriage. We were blended. And um, my husband had a daughter who was very manipulative and was feeding off of her mom and just bringing all kind of chaos into our household. She was disrespectful. She stole from us. Just constant problems. And his time with her was limited. She controlled the time that he got to see her. And it was usually around when she wanted something. And he was so hungry for that relationship that he would just let things fester. He would let things happen. He wouldn't address them. And it just created a lot of tension in the relationship between me and the daughter and between me and him. And I had raised a daughter who is, who's an adult. And in my mind, you know, I thought I had some valid pointers for him <laughs> of ways that he could address this relationship with his daughter and things that he could do to make things better. So first mistake I made was jumping on his piece of paper and helping him see ways that things could be fixed and that was very controlling in the process of, you know... <laughs> Try, trying to direct that on his piece of paper of what he needed to do, when he needed to do it, what he needed to say, because he just refused. He, he was just in, I don't know if it was denial or refusal to address it. And as I've learned, part of it was he was just trying to grasp for straws of any kind of relationship he could have with her. Mm. 
So did he take any of your suggestions, your helpful suggestions on board or? At first, you know, he was open to them, but I think he started over time, they started feeling like a personal attack on him that he wasn't doing his job as a father. He wasn't, he wasn't a good dad. It really wasn't about the marriage at that point out. He felt attacked as a father and as a person. And so that was really hard for him. And um, he didn't feel safe in telling me things. And so he started hiding things from me. Okay. And so you started finding out things that he wasn't telling you. Yes. And how, how did that go? Oh, that made things worse. Because when I find out, I'm like, why didn't you tell me this? Or why did, why'd you lie to me about this? Or why'd you hide this from me? And so I was more in, into his, his arena of things that, that I thought he should do. And not only was he not performing and handling them well, now he wasn't performing in the communication area either. So he felt very judged by me. Well, and you probably felt pretty betrayed by him because I did. Yeah. Here you start to feel kind of justified in a way, right? Because he's not being forthcoming. He's letting, letting this problem get worse and worse. It sounds like. So you probably felt more, yeah, more justified than ever to be on his paper telling him. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like, um, I think the biggest thing was I felt like he wasn't protecting our house and he wasn't putting me first and he wasn't protecting our marriage because he was allowing her to come in and um, create chaos or make messes and leave them or just the disrespect was huge. And I even twisted it at one point. She's not being disrespectful to me. She's being disrespectful to you. And how can you allow her to be disrespectful to you and, and do this to you? Yeah. So. so what was your relationship with your husband like at that point? It became more and more distant. He wouldn't look at me in the eye. He quit kissing me. Mm-hmm. I mean, he would hug me to the side or sex became much more spaced out. And I couldn't understand. We were actually, you know, fairly new into our marriage. This was two years into our marriage. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand why, you know, somebody I had just married and was so in love and so excited was so distant from me all of a sudden, you know, so quickly into the marriage. What did I do? And what was wrong? I was only trying to help him. And, you know, I I took it on on myself as responsibility. I was going to help grow up a healthy adult in this girl. (laughs) I wanted, you know, I wasn't just his wife. I I took it. I took ownership of trying to make her healthier and it just created so much tension and he didn't want to be around me. He found ways not to be around me. And it, it, it started off. He was at work a lot. Mm -hmm. He found ways to stay at work. He found ways to go to work on Saturdays. Oh, it was rough. Was there a moment when you thought, okay, this, we can't go on like this? Yeah, there was. And I was trying to figure out what was going on. I thought I'd look at his phone and see if maybe I could figure out what was going on. If if the ex-wife was communicating with him, just, you know, what was going on with the daughter. And what I found was even more heartbreaking. He had found someone else that he felt that he could talk to and they had built a relationship. and um there were pictures on his phone of her and there were text messages and there were emails and I was devastated. It sounds really heartbreaking. Speaking of betrayals. Yes. So, and so was this a full blown affair or just, they were just communicating? No, there was an affair. There was an affair. Oh yeah. Ouch. She was telling him that she loved him and that she wanted to be with him. Oh, Michelle horrible so so how did you respond to that you must be crying I confronted him I took his phone to him and I asked him what a text message pulled up and I asked him to explain it to me and um he he was very defensive very scared at first he was afraid I was gonna leave and um I wanted to leave I had actually bought your book about eight months earlier um, first killed all the marriage counselors because I was trying to figure out how to be a better wife and not push him away. 
and I was trying to figure out how to be a better stepmom. I was just desperate to figure out how to navigate this because this guy is the love of my life. I had never given my heart so fully to anybody in my life as I had him. And I just didn't want to lose him. And so I humbled myself I, and just picked up the book and started reading and realizing um, that I owned so much of the tension because I was so judgmental of him and I was all over his piece of paper trying to tell him something, how to do something that I really didn't understand. I didn't understand all the dynamics of what had happened and why he was handling things the way he was, why he was... Um, why he was being him Mm -hmm. because he was being the guy that I fell in love with and I was judging him for it and I was trying to control it and I pushed him away. So you find out he's having this affair, you confront him, he's afraid you're going to leave, you want to leave, but you didn't leave. You instead went down this other road, this road of humility it sounds like i went to him and i apologized to him laura sat him down on our back porch and i told him i said i really need to tell you something he said what and i said i need to apologize to you and he's like how could you tell me that you need to apologize to me and i said well for the last year and a half all i have done is judged and condemned you for the way you were handling the situation and that was wrong. And I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for the tension that I created. And I'm sorry for the judgment that I created. And I'm sorry for not trusting you to handle the situation. Wow. How did he respond to that? Tears. Oh, just tears. It's making me cry right now. Just hearing your beautiful accountability. So, yeah, he was probably expecting you to, to let him have it at that point. Yeah. He must US. have fallen out of his chair while he was, while he you was, were both he was, probably crying. Yeah. And we were both crying. He, um, he asked me what I wanted. And I just told him, I said, I, wanted, I want you to see me again the, like you did the day that you said I do. And I don't want you to see this judgment again. And I want you to be safe with me. I want you to tell me what you need, where you need me to support you and where you need me to stand beside you. And really going back to that picture of the helpmate, my job is to help him, not to make it harder on him. And I realized that's what I was doing. I was making it so hard on him. He had had no place to win. And the other thing he had told me several times was you always think the worst of me, you you know, whenever something comes up, you just automatically assume the worst. In that conversation, I remember saying to him, I am choosing to believe the best about you. And I trust that you're going to handle this. While I may not understand it, I trust that you have our best interests at heart, our whole family's interests at heart. It's not just about me. It's not just about our daughter. It's about our whole family. And that's one of the things I kept communicating to him as I've, I trust that you've got this. And there were times, Lord, I was still struggling. Like that net in my head with that, you know, was that train was running. <laughs> right. That emotional turmoil had left the station, but you weren't oh, yeah. giving voice to that. No, I literally have to talk myself off the fence. It's like, you're not getting on that train. You're, you're not going to go there. You're going to believe the best about him. And in those moments, I would go and say something to him about trusting him or I know you've got this. I trust that you've got this and I'm just leaving it with you. And I literally walk away and just have, I had to create an SFP for him that I know he's got this situation. I know he's going to handle the situation. And I know that in the long run, he is going to be the person that's going to handle it's not going to be me and what I found happened is when she would come around my stress level went down my blood pressure came down I could just be that goddess with him I could smile I could laugh 
with when, when your stepdaughter came around, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And we would be in the car going somewhere and I'd be joking around with him, joking around with her. And I just didn't try to fix it anymore because I'm such a fixer. Um, my profession is I'm a controller, or <laughs> a chief financial officer. This is what I do it's for your a living. title. You're a controller, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I it. just brought it right into the house. I just kept controlling and he didn't need me to control him. Right, right. I mean, the goals at work and at home are very different, right? You wanted him to see you like he did on the day he said, I do. Yeah. And that's very different than what you control at work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then along with it, I went through a health crisis as part of my forgiveness of him and my healing with him, where I was totally dependent on him to take care of me. Yeah. I had to trust him to take care of me. And I had to trust him that he was taking care of the big picture. I couldn't do it on my own. And so I really feel like I got put in that position. So I had to relinquish all control to him. And I've watched him step up. I've watched him truly love me through that. Because it was, there were some points, I don't think I was very pretty. (laughs) And he found ways to tell me how beautiful I was and how, you know, how much he saw me through what I was going through. And I know that he stepped away from that person. Um, There was for a long time, I I struggled with not knowing if she was truly gone. There was times I wanted to reach for that phone and look again. And part of my relinquishing control is walking away from the phone. Because I knew that even if I found something, it wasn't going to do me any good. And it wasn't going to help me trust him anymore. So I needed to trust that it wasn't there. So I want to hear, I love this. I think it sounds like a superpower because you came up with this spouse fulfilling prophecy. I trust you. I'm expecting the best. Uh, I know you've got this. It sounds like was your, was your yes. SFP. You n- knew there was another woman and yet you decided not to shop for pain by looking at the phone and you were able to follow through with that. And I know that can be very difficult. So how did you do that? Do you have a, anything you can share with us about how you made that happen? There were times I walked up to the phone and, and I just had to say, if, if we're going to move forward and if, if I'm going to tr- truly believe the best about him, I cannot pick up that phone. Because if I pick up the phone, I'm telling him I don't believe the best about him and I don't trust him. I'm lying to him. And he lied to me and it hurt me and I'm not going to hurt him. That's the biggest thing, was holding myself accountable to believe the best about my husband again. And for anybody who's been betrayed this way, this is so hard. So, hard. And I think that's why there's so many divorces, because no, it's so hard to get there. Yes, that, but you know what? It freed me. It did. It freed me from the control of believing the worst. And I saw in my husband's eyes again goodness instead of betrayal and I saw love in him that had I not done that I think I would have been constantly looking for something and I may have manufactured it on my own at times but because I chose to believe the best I couldn't go there so you very carefully chose your focus and then you had the experience that you were focused on which is that he is trustworthy and you can count on him. Yes. That's, yeah. That's very true. That's, I think it's amazing. I'm so impressed with your beautiful accountability. And I really hear this being like who you wanted to be. You wanted to be a trust, a trusting wife, one who has faith in her husband, who sees the best in him. That's how you wanted to show up. And you really committed to that. Well, you know what happens on the other side of they step up, Laura. They step up in ways that we never thought that they would step up. Well, tell and me about that. I got to tell my coach, I actually got to send her a picture. It was about four months after my surgery. My husband, I, you know, I was to the point that I could be alone at home. And um, my husband was gone for a little while and he came home and he bought me a new engagement ring and a new wedding band to replace the one that he had betrayed. 
and he reproposed to me and replaced my wedding set. And I never thought that that was not that I wanted, you know, wanted a new one, but he felt like it was necessary to give me a new promise. Yeah. So he became a better man. Yes. So what's your relationship like now? It's, I'm not going to tell you, we still don't have problems with the daughter because we do. We, in the last couple of months, we've gone through a pretty big trial with a daughter. Sure. But instead of me jumping in and trying to tell him how to fix it, he just tells me, he tells me what he's feeling. And he's come to conclusions about the relationship and things that he needs to do without my input. And he shares them with me. And then, you know, I'll ask him, are you okay? When he's going through something, are you okay? How are you feeling? Valuing him as the person and valuing his feelings in the middle of it. And I think that shows him that I respect him. I respect him as a person, um, but I care about him as a person too. I want to make sure he's all right because it hurts. It hurt. It still hurts him. And I don't think I was acknowledging that before how much hurt he was going through. And um, he'll lay, you know, he, he just hugs me constantly and he's just there. The messages are coming all day on the phone. He, he organizes dates. He, he finds silly things to do and we laugh a lot. And that's the thing I think I had missed the most. I missed his laughter. And I've got my, I've got my happy husband back. Oh, and he no. tells me how happy he is. Wow. Amazing. So if you could go back in time and talk to Shannon before and tell her what, you know, what you know now, what would you say to her? Choose to believe the best. Choose to trust. Don't control. You know, you had written something. Um, I, I don't need to say everything I think. I've noticed that because I'm not saying them and focusing on them, my thoughts and actions have changed. Yeah. And so I was interested about that, that you're, you feel like your thoughts, even your thoughts have changed. Tell us about that. Um, I'm not carrying the burden of fixing this anymore. I'm not carrying the burden of that I'm responsible for parenting her. My thought changed. My responsibility is to love, love, support, and be the helpmate to my husband instead of trying to fix something that's not mine. And I, I like your take on helpmate very much, Michelle, because you're, we've all heard that, right? We've all said, okay, I've got to help my husband. And I certainly took that as, you know, get on his paper and tell him how to do things. And you have a very different take on how to help your husband now than you did before. It's, it's he's got it. I'm there to just be by his side and encourage him. I'm his biggest cheerleader. He knows how to play that field. I mean, he, he's stronger than I am. He's in so many ways smarter than I am. And I think the big thing is just acknowledging he needs me to be that loving safety for him. And that's how I help him. I am safe for him. You've definitely created amazing emotional safety in your relationship. Was there ever a struggle with resentment? Like feeling like, why do I have to do all this stuff? Why am I doing everything? He's the one that it was lying to me. He's the one that had the affair. Why does this have to be on me? In all honesty, yes, there was. And that was part of. I'd go down that negative emotional train and that's what would, that's what would take me there. And I'd have to remind myself of who I wanted, what I wanted. And I didn't want another divorce. I'd been through one. I didn't want another one. He was the love of my life and I wanted him and he was mine. I still had his ring. I still had his name and I was going to keep him. And so just telling myself I couldn't, I couldn't focus on those things. I couldn't focus on the resentment. Believe me, there's plenty of times I wanted to pick up the phone and call that woman and say, back off. But I couldn't do that. I had to trust that he was going to do that. He was going to handle it. And 
it wasn't just the daughter. It was this woman too. I had to trust him to handle her and trust him to put that to bed, literally just put it away and not let it come back, close the door to it. And I think sometimes with women that have been through this and through an affair, they're afraid that it's going to happen again. And that resentment of I'm fixing this and it could happen again can take hold. And that's where I have to go back to my SFP. I believe the best about him. He's not going to let this happen again. He saw what it caused. He's told me that he wonders if what I went through physically was caused by that. And he's felt so bad (sighs) that he might've been part of me getting sick. And I just had to tell him, no, you know, I don't, I don't think it did, but he takes ownership. And so he sounds very accountable also. He is accountable. That's not what was happening before. It doesn't sound like. No, it wasn't. But when you back, you know, when you back somebody into a corner, what do they do? They have to find a way to protect themselves. And sometimes they put somebody, somebody or something in between you and them to protect themselves. And I think that's what affairs are because they don't, people don't want to face the truth of what's wrong in their relationship. So they put something in the middle to feel like they're being protected. Wow. It's amazing to hear you take that as kind of a 10,000 foot view of an affair, but this is also very personal for you. And yeah, I just admire your commitment. It's, it's tremendous. I, I'm very impressed by what you've accomplished. What's your tip for uh, someone who's listening right now? And she is where you were. He's lying. He's having an affair. He's got, you know, maybe there's problems with a blended family and She's feeling really hopeless. Like, where should she start? What should she do? I think for me, was writing down what I wanted. What was it that I wanted? You know, there's an old start with the end in mind. Stephen Covey. Yeah. What is your What is your end game? What do you want? If you want the marriage, look in the mirror. You may not like what you see in the mirror. Affairs are not always. Everybody's is different. So I'm going to be really careful saying this. For me, my affair was two-sided. The affair that happened in my marriage was two-sided. I owned part of that. And I can only speak for myself, Laura. I had to take an, an account of what I had done. And I had to take responsibility. And I had to go say I was sorry. And he could have still pursued the other woman. He could have. I'm lucky. He heard me and he accepted my apology as much as I accepted his. I'm very fortunate and I know that. And so I don't want anyone to feel like I'm judging in any way. That's just what worked for me was taking accountability of what I saw in the mirror. Well, I think it's amazing. And I do I know, uh, I appreciate you speaking so carefully about it because the last thing anybody here wants to do is blame somebody who's feeling like, listen, I I didn't do this. This this just happened. Uh, You know, my husband had an affair and you don't want to, you don't want to blame the victim, of course, but I, I can't help but think you say, I know I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm lucky that he ended it, but I can't help but think there might be a correlation between your enormous accountability and the way he showed up uh, for you after that and really made you as one and only again and got those new rings for you. I think when we, I think when we humble ourselves, great good comes out of it. And humility is, is it's a two-sided equation. You have to give it and you have to receive it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, You're an amazing example of that. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm inspired by your story and how you saved your family and got the love of your life back. So congratulations on what you've accomplished. I know it takes a lot of courage to do what you did. Yeah, well, it's it's been a journey. I I remember posting out in um, the shared site, 
people would wonder, I hadn't been on the site and through coaching for very long. They're like, how'd you get here so fast? I need people to understand. It was a two year journey for me. Um, between the time that I bought the book to I finally got in coaching and there were still days and I have to remind myself, you're not getting on that train. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think, we, I think that's the important thing. You have to continue to practice the skills. And for me, the releasing control, the get, staying off of his piece of paper and laughing with him, being that goddess with him. Even there's days I don't feel like it. Just getting up and, and being his goddess so that he, you know, he feels like he has it all. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I think he does have it all. So thank you. Well done, thank Ms. you so much, Laura. I cannot thank you enough and your team enough. Great to hear. Fantastic. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice I find entirely atrocious this week is that the way to get your husband to shape up is to punish him until he does the right thing. Because when people aren't behaving the way we want them to, either giving them the silent treatment or yelling at them or lecturing them will make them straighten up right away. Yeah, well, not in my experience. That didn't work at all. None of those things got my husband to respond to me better or do the things I'd always wanted him to do. And looking back, I can see that my urge to punish him worked against me every single time. I mean, that made the chasm wider, made him want to run further away, and it made him want to turn the TV up even louder. Well, of course it did, because it's very unpleasant when someone gives you silent treatment or lectures or yells. Who wants to be around that? Nobody. But if you're like I was, and you don't have any other training and you don't know what else to do, it's hard to give up that urge to punish because it feels like you're giving up on ever getting what you want. After all, you already tried having a State of the Union address and discussing it calmly, or maybe not so calmly. You, I mean, you tried saying it nicely, right? Or, or, or maybe not so nicely. If, you, if you've already tried everything that you can think of, and he's still not doing what you want him to do at all, Punishment can feel like all you've got. It's your last hope to make him improve or else you'll just have to suffer forever and ever. And let's not forget ever. But what if your last hope is actually the counterfeit that's costing you so many of the things you'd love to have, like tenderness and laughter and passion? Punishing my husband made me very prickly and it's just not that easy to hug a porcupine. So what if you decided not to punish him, even if he's been absolutely atrocious? For example, what if you decided to cheerfully say good morning, even if you knew he'd been out very late, having a good time instead of coming to bed with you like he should? One student decided to do just that, which is how she learned that her husband had actually come home pretty early and that she had inadvertently locked the bedroom door, not wanting to wake her up. Her husband had been sleeping in the next room the whole time. She was laying awake, wondering where he was. She did her inner happy dance when she realized that she had overridden her desire to punish her husband and preserve the intimacy and the connection when it turned out her suspicions about him were completely wrong. But what if you're right and he's really doing something awful and hurtful, something really out of line? Then what? 
the desire to punish him may come on strong. And along with it, there's an invitation to lose not only your dignity and the emotional safety, but also the energy to accomplish other things in life. And I still remember that. You know, in my experience, there wasn't much to gain from turning into the punisher. Now, there's plenty to gain from tuning into yourself and honoring yourself, like asking yourself how you feel and what you want. That's always valuable. And it's especially important when you're hurting. This is no time to abandon yourself. You may feel really hurt and need some TLC from your mom or your bestie or your pals in the Ridiculously Happy Wife program or the Diamond Private Coaching program. I mean, what a great decision to bring your vulnerability to them so you can avoid the punishment hangover and break the terrible old cycle you've been stuck in. What about his consequences, though? You may be wondering, when does he pay for his crimes? Well, I found that once I disengaged from punishing my husband, his true intentions to love me, to protect me, to give me special treatment, that shone through brighter than ever. And there wasn't so much to punish him for anymore. I see so many students experience the same thing. Just deciding to stop punishing him is a great way to get back to feeling like you're on the same team and you bring out his best and he brings out your best. It takes some focus. It takes some determination for sure, like everything else that's worthwhile in life. But I've found I don't miss the emotional hangover, the tension and the energy drain of punishing the man I love most in the world. For that reason, the advice that you should punish your husband until he does the right thing is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about the law of attraction for relationships. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that for months after the pandemic started, we cooked at home every day. But now I can only fit all the takeout containers in the refrigerator because I've played a lot of Tetris. Tetris.